The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus told this parable to his disciples. The kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were sensible. The foolish ones did take their lamps, but they brought no oil. Whereas the sensible ones took flasks of oil as well as their lamps. The bridegroom was late, and they all grew drowsy and fell asleep. But at midnight there was a cry, The bridegroom is here, go out and meet him. At this, all those bridesmaids woke up and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish ones said to the sensible ones, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. But they replied, There may not be enough for us and for you. You had better go to those who sell it and buy some for yourselves. They had gone off to buy it when the bridegroom arrived. Those who were ready went in with him to the wedding hall, and the door was closed. The other bridesmaids arrived later. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you solemnly, I do not know you. So stay awake, because you do not know either the day or the hour. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Our reading today is a text that has so much in it. But then every text does, you know that. But this one is speaking to us about end times and speaking to us about separation. That at the end, there'll be a separation. And in this separation, you'll be judged between whether you're wise or whether you're or is, is foolish or unwise, which one? And at the end of time, when the great moment reveals itself and the judgment day comes, wisdom and foolishness is the axis around which we will be judged. And the wise will be inside the banquet hall and the foolish will be outside, where there will be gnashing of teeth. And one person said, and if, if for those who have no teeth, teeth will be provided. <laughs> you had to gnash something. The reading today is, is based on a whole understanding of a wedding feast in Israel of the first century. And in this understanding of the wedding, what we're working with here is that the wedding took place when the groom comes and is betrothed to the, to the bride, and the betrothal is already the marriage. It's not an engagement in us, it's not a promise. It is a marriage already. They are already bound together. But he then goes off and starts building house and making sure he has what he needs to bring his wife home and then at some stage when the time is ready and the house is ready, he goes back to the bride's house, picks up the bride with a whole entourage of his, so he'll have all of the groomsmen there and it'll be great festivity, and she will bring and have all of her maids ready for, for the festivity at her house, and, and then they will make their way back to the, the groom's house where the marriage is consummated. And then that feast is a, is a seven-day feast. They, they were serious about marriage. What we have in our text is that there's an interval between the, bride, the bridegroom and the, with the, the, the marriage, the betrothal, 
and the bridegroom coming to claim his bride. That's what we have. Now, the whole of the Old Testament has lots of images of bride and bridegrooms. And in the Old Testament, God is the bridegroom. And in the New Testament, several times, Jesus is portrayed to us as the bridegroom coming to meet his bride. In the New Testament, in, in the book of Revelations, the, the Eucharist is spoken about as a, the celebration of the marriage of the Lamb and his bride. And so the encounter with God, the encounter with Jesus, is really that, that nuptial encounter or that nuptial celebration where bride and bridegroom come together. And every time we come to the Eucharist, we come to that experience where we are celebrating the celebration of the marriage of the, the, the Lamb and his bride, the church. And how many times have you come to this celebration? How many times have you come to this celebration and you might as well have got luck outside because you can't even remember the end what the gospel was you can't remember nothing that happened. You say, wait, he said he's our father yet? Because we, are, we have come, but we are not attentive to what we have come to. So let's look at our text now with some, some more detail and see where the text leads us. So when the bridegroom comes, he meets the situation where they are, the, the ten virgins are all asleep. And as they hear the bridegroom is here, come out and meet him. They all wake up quickly. And the smart ones have had all their preparation already made. And the foolish ones have no preparation made. And, and what, what is the preparation? Because they're going out with their lights into the darkness to meet the groom, to escort him to the bride so that this great celebration can be begin. Now, the, the lamps that they would have used for this kind of event was like a flambeau. It was like a stick with cloth wrapped on it, soaked in oil so that when you lit it, it would just keep burning because of the oil. And if there was no oil, what would happen is it just would not burn. And so what they're playing with here is that the five who are sensible have their lights there, have their oil, and can pour the oil on the cloth, light the, the lamp, and go out to meet the bridegroom. And those who are foolish have their lamps all there with their cloth, but there is no oil. And because there is no oil, we have the trouble. And they are, say, and they are told, they said to the, the, the smart ones, give us some of your oil. They said, but if we do that, there would not be enough for you and us. In other words, the light cannot be lit with half the oil. So you need all of this oil if we're going to make this procession. And, and if they gave half, then there would be no light at all. Go and find some and, and, buy, and buy what you can in the middle of the night. In the middle of the night. And, and come back to the celebration. What the text is, is working with here is light and oil. Oil is what keeps the light alight. And that's what it's working with. And, and we better understand what the light is. And we better understand what the oil is. Because that's what will determine whether we're bright or foolish. And, and that's what will determine whether we find ourselves inside or outside. So let's look at our text again. If we go to the first reading to understand what the wise virgins are about, the reading gives us lots of great hints. Wisdom is bright and does not grow dim. That's where it starts, eh? In other words, the light of wisdom does not go out. The light of wisdom does not go out. And, and, and further down the text, it says, watch for her early and you will have no trouble. In other words, if you live a life where the inner life is, is at the very fore of your life, you will have no trouble. Because when it says, watch for her early, what is it speaking about? Waking up to? Nobody knows? Gosh, we're in trouble. 
waking up to pray watch for her early why do we wake early we wake to watch for god we wake to pray we wake to to wait on god we wake so that we we start seeing who god is watch for her early and you will have no trouble you will find her sitting at your gate even to think about her is understanding fully grown. And, and, and what the whole of the first reading speaks about in wisdom is that wisdom is this wonderful character that will always serve us when we are in pursuit of her. But, but we must be in pursuit of her. Our whole life must be directed towards her and then she will pursue us. And so the difference already we could start seeing between this, the wise and the foolish is living your life in pursuit of wisdom, which is waking early, which is the whole of the spiritual life, which means having a relationship with God, which means having time set aside for, for that relationship and treating that relationship as a primary relationship in your life that is above all other things in your life. And, and by putting God first in this relationship, we start understanding that what wisdom is calling us to is disposing our life to God and living by the first commandment that the Lord your God is one and you must have nothing else before him. And when we put God first and pursue God with everything within us, it is God who ends up serving us and, and pursuing us and giving us all that we need to live the, the, the life and all that we need to become, to be part of this banquet, this incredible festivity of the marriage between Christ and his bride, the church. But the gospel gives us some other clues. Because when we're speaking about lights, we have to go back to Matthew 5, where Matthew says, no one lights a lamp to put it under a, a bushel. But, but light your lamp so that all who may see it may praise God by your good works. By your good works. And so Matthew 5 gives us a clue of interpreting this text down in Matthew 25. By speaking to us about what the light is. The light is the good works. It is the good works that we do. The charity that we perform. The, the way in which we, we reach to, to people in love and, 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 and in dignity. It, it is a disposition towards others where we treat other people as if they are people. And where we give everyone dignity. And the more society looks down on a particular one, is the more dignity we give them because we recognize in them the face of God himself. And so the light is charity. And, and Pope Benedict recovered this word charity. When we hear charity, what we hear is giving a little something to somebody who is in need. And that's not charity. Caritas is, is the most costly form of love. It, it is about giving yourself in love to another person, another person who cannot give you back. That's what charity is. It's about giving in a, in a way that, that will stretch your heart and your whole life, especially when they can't give you back, and especially when other people look down upon them and call them by all kinds of foolish names. So the, 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 the reading now gives us a clue because the good works, the, the, the caritas, the, the charity, which is a light which we must hold, is, is what must be available at all times. And now that we understand that the light is charity, which is the good works that we do, which is the way that we love and the way that we show human dignity and respect to other people, we understand now that a Christian without charity is not a Christian at all. And to stand without charity for one another, is, it, it means that the faith that we say we have is no faith at all. And that's James. You show me your, your faith and I'll show you my good works. By my good works I will show you and demonstrate faith, but your faith has nothing to show for it. If, if we are not a people who are 
putting ourselves in the disposition of wisdom and seeking after God day and night, waking early in prayer and, and, and building this personal relationship with God. If we are not there, then the charity will not be produced. You see, Christianity is not a club where you pay your membership fees, you become a club member, and after that, all you have to do is show up. That's not Christianity. It's not about showing up for an event or showing up for the Eucharist or showing up for this or that. It is about a dedication of your whole life in pursuit of this God who has first called you into being. Waking early in the morning to pray and giving to those who have nothing and, 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 and treating people like people. But the text goes on, you know, it goes on to say, after they've gone and they got the oil and, or whatever they got, they come back and they knock on the, on the door of the banquet hall and they say, Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. And he replied, I tell you solemnly, I do not know you. Phew. Take that now. Huh? Now, now, I don't know about you, you know. But, but the only real disaster in life, the only real disaster in life is reaching to the doors of the banquet hall and hearing, who is you? Who, wait, 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 wait. Who, who, who is you again? I, me not know you. Me not know you. Who is you? That is the only real disaster in life. Everything else we could organize, but that one have no comeback position from it. And, and that text, to understand it, we have to go back now to Matthew, Matthew 7, where they, they're knocking again and they're saying, Lord, Lord. And Jesus said, not them who say, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But those who? Say it again for a minute. Those who? And they, and they say, surely you'll say to me, we prophesy in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We heal in your name. We, we, we help live in water in your name. We, 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 we did this in your name and we did that in your name. And he say, who is you? Me or know you. And, and the text of, of Matthew 7, which is one way of interpreting this text here, is, is a suggestion, and, and more than that, a key to understanding that unless there is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, where he is your God and you are his child, unless that is the rock foundation of your life, you and, and him and, and the eternal banquet and, and that peace in heaven in trouble. And how, if, if, if you have a relationship with somebody, just check them out once a year. Eh? Because if in the year you change your hairstyle or anything else, you say, wait, wait, who is that? Who is that? The text is, is pushing and provoking us about what salvation is really about. And it starts with a relationship with Christ. And to have a relationship with Christ, go back to the first reading again. We wake early in the morning and we pray. We, we, we do the meditation on the scriptures. We live in a particular kind of way. Go to the light and, and there we will see that we treat people like people and we love one another. And, and that we are, we are a people who, who have a certain humility before others and, and before our God. And, and that, that we come before God empty-handed, knowing that it is his love alone that will bring us salvation. And that, that text of, of, of Matthew 7, just before the Lord, Lord, it says, A good tree produces good fruit. A bad tree produces bad fruit. And when you see bad fruit being produced, you can't call the tree good. When the fruit is rotten, how you could call the tree good? You see, the text is saying something about virtue. And, and, and by, by the fruit, you will know them. 
And, and the Christian who is producing bad fruit, when he knock on the door, what he will hear is, Mina no you. Who is you again? Who is you? Who is you? The text, brothers and sisters, is one of these incredible, somber wake-up calls for us. St. Augustine talks about the, the oil as, as faith and charity. Because as, a, as, as faith is a lamp, or the good works is a, is a lamp that, we, that, we, that burns, the charity and, and, the, and the faith is, is, is what is the oil that allows the lamp to, to, to burn and the light to shine. This text is speaking to the whole of the spiritual life. To the whole spiritual life. And, and, and it's a wake-up call for every single one of us to ask ourselves. Because when we come to the banquet here on earth, where the angels of God in heaven are, are in awe and, and, and majesty and worship and, and are enthralled before the Lamb who was slain, who is on this altar. When the priest says, Lamb of God in heaven, all of the angels are around the Lamb of God in worship. And, and heaven and earth are united. And if we are not awake and alert and alive because we can see him, because we know him, then we come here and we say boring because we don't even know to what we came. Because we're sleeping. And when we go out and we see those in need and those who are in distress and we can't recognize his face in them, we can't because we don't know him. We don't know him. Good tree, good fruit. Bad tree, bad fruit. At the end of the text it says that stay awake because you do not know either the day or the hour. And, and the second reading reminds us that it's not only his coming in death, but also his coming in the final resurrection of the dead. And why do we wait with vigilance? Because we want to see God. Why do we want to see God? Because we want to know God as God really is. We want to be in that party of all parties where the festivity never ends and the wine never runs out and the food is rich and succulent and, and, and incredible and never ending. We want to be in, in, in that amazing place. And virtual heaven will not cut it. <laughs> virtual heaven will not cut it. So I would advise you if, you, if you can, and you should, get out your pajamas next week and come to the real thing. Amen. <laughs>